to uh, open uh, this uh, session uh, with uh, Doug, Doug Stone from Yale University, who will tell us why the laser line width is, no, is so narrow. Insights from <coughs> nuclear emission physics. Thank you. you? Uh, actually, I've sort of changed the title because okay. I'm not going to just focus on that, but that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, Okay, so thank you for coming and for inviting me. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, Alex Surgeon is a recently finished PhD student. Will Sweeney is a, is a mid-career PhD student in my group. Hidong Chong is now a uh, former postdoc now at uh, Nanyang University in Singapore. Li Ge is a assistant professor at CUNY Staten Island. And uh, Adi Pick. I hope is here. Uh, so she is uh, uh, a collaborator from MIT doing her PhD with Stephen Johnson. We've had a really fruitful collaboration and I'm just going to kind of set the stage for her talk after mine in terms of some very exciting developments on the theory of the laser line width that she's been working on for her thesis. And uh, a lot of what I've been working now in laser physics, well, for maybe 15 years, but very closely for the last decade with my colleague Wei Sao, who uh, does experimental physics and also does a lot of computational physics in the laser area. This is her postdoc, Brandon Redding. At the end of the talk, for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you some really exciting applications of the work we did. Um, so uh, for those of you who are trying to convince funding agencies that you might do something useful with this type of physics, it might be helpful. Um, Okay, so the basic uh, approach that uh, I've been developing is uh, treating lasers as scattering systems, but with a non-unitary and non-linear S matrix. And uh, many of you have heard a version, an earlier version of this. So this is a, I skip a little more of the pedagogical stuff, but if you're lost, ask me. Um, but, uh, oh. Anyway, this is, I think, something that's a relatively new point of view in laser theory. And um, uh, I want to emphasize the role of the nonlinearity in the laser equations and stabilizing the non-Hermitian singularities that occur in the linear theory, which uh, actually are what we call the, the lasing transition. Uh, yeah. In, you know, an S matrix, you, you, it's, a, it's an object where I tell you the inputs, you tell me the outputs. Now, the actual S matrix is, depends on the, the amplitude of the input, so it's a nonlinear object. But it still takes you input to output. You can just call it the lasing map if you want. You know, it maps you from input to output. But, you know, because we often are interested in linearizing around something, it's, I still think of it. Okay, um, or it's a self-consistent S matrix. So, uh, and there is this historic question, um, which I'm going to come to in you know a few minutes. Why is the laser line so narrow? Uh, well, the reason it's narrow is because it actually is a non-Hermitian singularity, but uh, they don't like that answer. Anyway, uh, I, I I have a few. Um, uh, I think pedagogical comments about how to and, and demonstrations about how, how it becomes so narrow. Okay. And then at the end I'm going to talk about the applications of the nonlinear theory, both to optical isolation or non-reciprocity and uh, to uh, speckle free imaging and remote sensing oh, based on this. Okay. All right. So and the point of view of this talk is probably biorthogonal to a lot of the stuff not fully orthogonal maybe, to the, uh, the conference in the sense that I'm really not at all focused on PT. So um, this is, uh, is uh, a talk which base is based on the idea that many important physical systems have effective theories which are non-Hermitian, for example, classical electrodynamics, which is what I'm going to be talking about, and um, there's not as much mathematical and theoretical physics focusing on those uh, problems uh, or using all the tools that we, that in this community you're familiar with. Um, and the complex eigenvalues, unlike the PT problem where we're sort of 
thinking, well, in the PT unbroken phase, we've got real eigenvalues and that's going to be helpful, you know, but the complex thing maybe we're less excited about. Um, here, uh, the complex eigenvalues have physical meaning. They mean either attenuation or amplification and they have to be studied, okay? And the lasing problem has a fundamentally non-Hermitian boundary condition because you're looking for purely outgoing solutions of the classical equations or of the semi-classical equations. Um, and so you're not going to find the right solution in, in some sort of effective Hermitian theory. Um, and also they're fundamentally nonlinear and you need to include that nonlinearity to stabilize the solution. And I think that's something we've, we've gone a long ways towards kind of emphasizing. Um, now, PT symmetry emphasizes the non-trivial role of gain and loss if it's not uniformly introduced. So if you just put gain and loss uniformly, you know, it, it does something simple to the solutions. But if you put it non-uniformly in some way, in space or in some, you know, the boundary or something like that, then it really does some new things uh, which are still being studied. Um, Okay, so textbook laser, you have some kind of atomic or molecular medium uh, called the gain medium, and you pump energy in, and um, uh, you have some resonator to trap the light, and often it consists of a, a well-reflecting mirror and a less well-reflecting mirror, the output mirror, and as you increase the pump, oh, and this resonator has certain uh, passive cavity resonances with some width, one over tau, and spacing delta omega. Um, and then you pump harder, and uh, you get this uh, narrow focused beam of light out, often at more than one frequency, actually, but we'll get there. Um, and uh, you can, of course, measure these passive cavity resonances in the cavity without the gain medium. And the standard view is we should really think of the um, Lasing is just sort of the passive cavity resonance uh, somehow uh, boosted. Um, this isn't correct. There really is a difference, and that's what I'm gonna, one of the things I'm going to emphasize. So before the laser turns on, it, 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 the real laser doesn't go from zero to a finite output sort of in one, you know, at one singular point. It starts to emit um, a lot of noise as you get near to this threshold where on average, it emits light. Um, so this is what you see. You see amplified spontaneous emission around the frequency of the atomic transition in the gain medium, let's say, is there, okay? But then you can tell that it's lasing, okay, because you get these narrow lines coming out. And the narrow lines are not necessarily at the center of the atomic transition, you know? So this, this the fact that it's displaced is telling you something also about the cavity tell you more about that but okay and often you have multiple lines you don't just have a single frequency in a laser um, okay so the usual way that this is described um, uh, it, when you neglect the quantum effects is through what's called semi-classical lasing theory and so you write down Maxwell oops sorry you write down Maxwell's equations um, but you put the polarization of the gain medium as a source uh, for radiation, and then you put, okay, well, what I'm, I'm doing something slightly different because what you would see in a textbook is they would introduce the resonator, then they would say there are modes of the resonator, they would often approximate them as just being Hermitian modes, and then they would expand the space dependence in those modes, and it would only be a time-dependent theory, and that's where they start to go wrong. Okay, but I'm saying, okay, this is the, the fundamental problem. You've got some uh, cavity, and it could be a very strange cavity. Later, I'm going to talk about random lasers. So it doesn't have to be those two mirrors. It can be very complicated. Um, and, and somewhere in it, you have the gain medium, and outside you have air, let's say. Um, and, um, and the theory I'm going to tell you can really treat fairly complicated gain media but um, I'm only going to treat the sort of simplest model you find in chapter four of a textbook, which is two level atoms uh, characterized by their polarization and their inversion of the population. Okay, and another comment for experts is that this is not really the Maxwell wave equation, which is curl, curl, et cetera, but um, we can write this theory and we, 
Adi probably will write it with the full Maxwell wave equation. It doesn't really change things very fundamentally, but it does, you know, if you have complicated polarization effects, it would matter, and you can certainly do that. Um, okay, and then the polarization is related through some susceptibility, which has a linear part, which we're just putting here as the epsilon cavity, as a nonlinear part due to the gain medium, uh, and uh, um, that's going to close these equations. So in order to have the full dynamics of the laser, you need to write equations for the three fields, the electric field, the polarization field, and the inversion for this simple two-level model. It's even got more equations if I have many levels. And um, uh, there's this superscript plus here, which means that you're looking in the rotating wave approximation. So you do the positive and negative frequency components separately and you neglect the counter-rotating terms. Um, and so this is a set of coupled nonlinear uh, PDEs. Um, and uh, so here's, uh, it's a damp driven system. So the damping coefficients here are the dephasing of the polarization due to the environment, the relaxation of the inversion due to, you know, the, the environment as well. Uh, and then uh, there's your nonlinearity which effectively makes this equation nonlinear. And then um, you have the drive to, to gives us a steady state. And I'm representing the, the drive here by D0, which you can also say is the inversion that you would have in the absence of um, any electric field. So uh, these, this is the standard model. It was introduced by uh, Hawken and Lamb in 63. And it describes, everybody agrees that these equations or the generalization to more complicated gain media describe lasers except for quantum fluctuations. So there's no disagreement. It's just that these are coupled nonlinear equations in space and time. And they're very, you know, almost essentially impossible to solve uh, analytically and um, pretty hard to solve even numerically. So almost every treatment is then a series of approximations on these equations. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things I want to say. Okay, so we wanted to, uh, because this is a damp-driven system, we can have all sorts of interesting dynamics. These can be chaotic fields uh, in the right regime, et cetera. Um, but we wanted to focus on spatial complexity and non-hermeticity and so on, so we didn't want to consider complicated temporal dynamics. We only wanted to consider t complicated spatial structures and so on, and multi-mode lazy. So we said, well, let's look for steady state periodic solutions of these equations, but without any modal approximations. Okay, and the, the theory is called steady state ab initio laser theory so that it has a nice, uh, it has a nice um, acronym SALT. Um, if you go to my webpage, you'll see a big picture of Angelina Jolie and a comment from Yi Dong Chong that amazingly this movie had nothing to do with steady state ab initio laser theory. I should have put that up there so, you know, in the spirit of Carl with his funny photos. Um, okay, so we have these coupled equations and we're gonna look for these steady state multi-periodic solutions. K mu and omega mu are the same, C is equal to one, so this is the frequency of the response, which could be lasing or amplification, I'll, I'll get back to that. And there's some number of frequencies uh, in it, but it's, they're, they're, well, okay, this is what we do. And then we, uh, we relate the polarization to the lasing mode or to the amplified mode, psi mu, through the susceptibility, which for a two-level gain medium in the linear approximation is just this square root of a Lorentzian proportional to the pump D0. And as you pump and D0, this, as I said, is actually the equilibrium inversion. So when you invert and it's positive, then the imaginary part of the susceptibility is negative which corresponds to amplification. So that can never happen in equilibrium. We can't just create energy out of nothing, but in non-equilibrium steady state, we can have this amplification, okay? And now we plug this uh, proposed solution in here, and we see that um, uh, using this relation and these definitions, that this term is actually a four-wave mixing term in which the different lasing modes would beat against each other with the difference frequency. And this is what can cause all the, the problems. This can drive chaos and so on. But, um, 
but in a certain limit, which is actually realized in many, many lasers, this beating term is very fast, and so you can average it out to zero, and that's the approximation we use, which was not our idea. This goes back to Hawken and other people, I think. Okay, so it turns out when the relaxation rate of the inversion, which is this thing gamma parallel, is small compared to the dephasing and the spacing of the modes, which I'm calling delta here, spacing and frequency of the modes, and these are now the lasing modes, not any kind of set of Hermitian modes or anything like that. These are unknown non-Hermitian objects, so I'm you. Um, um, then we can actually neglect this. We can average out that cross term. And now this becomes a time independent, uh, you know, thing that depends on the intensities times the susceptibility. And if you put that in here, it's now time independent. Now we can have a solution. Nothing is time dependent. We can look for d dot equal to zero for the steady state solution where the inversion is constant in time. Okay, so that's what we do. We look for the solution where the inversion is constant in time, and we find that there's this kind of saturated inversion where d0, which can depend on space, this, this equilibrium inversion in the absence of an external, of a, of a field, is now, uh, if you like, oops, reduced or renormalized by one plus the intensity squared of all the lacing modes. So this is a saturated nonlinear object. Uh, and then the susceptibility is, is gamma mu times this saturated inversion, the full susceptibility in the presence of lasing or amplification. And then we just have a nice wave equation that looks sort of like a Helmholtz equation, um, but, um, but we have, this is not linear because if I put this in here, now I have a nonlinear uh, saturable term in the wave equation. And, but this is completely general, and you, you know, before our work, I never saw this formulated. I mean, maybe some brilliant people understood this well, but, so this, you know, if you neglect the beating terms, which lead to more complicated dynamical phenomena, then you just have this nonlinear saturable equation for these unknown modes um, uh, that, you, that are the lasing modes and these unknown lasing frequencies. Now, there are two possible boundary conditions for this equation. One is just, you actually say my boundary condition is I'm inputting a wave at a certain frequency, omega mu, and then I have the normal Maxwell continuity conditions for scattering from whatever my resonator plus gain medium is, and um, there will be a solution for any input frequency, and physically if I put in a wave, something's going to happen. It's going to get amplified um, and come back out. So I can solve the, that amplification problem, but I have these additional solutions which are unique uh, for this uh, non-remission problem, which is I have some purely outgoing solutions at infinity, which satisfy Sommerfeld boundary conditions, um, and then I'm only going to have solutions at discrete frequencies. And this is actually what we focus on first, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about both things. So if you think of this system as a scattering system, um, uh, you have the scattering is fine. I put something in, I get something out. We're all familiar with that. But you have these additional solutions you don't have in standard scattering problems where I put nothing in and something comes out. And that's, of course, the laser. That's exciting. Self-organized oscillator, um, et cetera. Um, OK, so if we think of this as a scattering problem where um, the index of refraction in this wave equation is just the cavity dielectric function and then this nonlinear susceptibility, which is complex and has a negative uh, imaginary part so that it's amplifying, uh, then uh, we're, you know, this is what you guys work on. It's, uh, uh, this is a non-remission wave equation. We can think of this IN2 as the uh, imaginary potential. Obviously, it's slightly different because it multiplies the eigenvalue, but uh, it's essentially the same kind of structure of a non-remission potential. Okay. Um, so I'm defining now this scattering matrix, S, which depends on Though both this index of refraction or function and the frequency or the wave vector k scattering some input alpha into beta. And this is both non-unitary because we have this non-hermitian wave equation and it's non-linear because the index of refraction is this saturable non-linear object. Okay, so alpha goes in and beta comes out and there's more beta coming out than alpha going in. Um, and if I put too much alpha in, then less beta comes out proportionally because of the saturation, which is you know, a known thing to anybody that works with amplifiers. Okay, 
But we're going to consider lasing first, because that's in some sense the most unusual thing about this mathematical problem, where we don't send anything in. Okay, so we don't send anything in. So alpha is zero, and we're trying to get a finite beta. And this is essentially a definition of the poles of the scattering matrix. And since nothing's gone in, E is equal to zero, um, at least at threshold, this really is a linear problem. Okay? Um, now, if we're trying to make this kind of solution when alpha is, is zero, we look at the passive cavity where the index of refraction only involves, let's say, the real index of refraction of the mirrors or the cavity. Um, then uh, S is unitary and the poles are off the real axis. So here's a si the simple model we often show of just a mirror, partially re perfect mirror, partially reflecting mirror, one dimension, uh, and just solve for the, the poles of that uh, system, the purely outgoing solutions. There they are, uh, just separated by C pi over L, um, and so on. But now that's not the problem we actually want to solve. We want to solve it with a gain medium and a pump, which inverts the gain medium. So that means we're adding to the index of refraction this imaginary amplifying piece. And for each value of the pump, let's say we start from pumping uh, to, so that the populations are equal. That's called the transparency point, where the gain medium actually doesn't do anything when I have exactly the same um, uh, populations in the upper and lower level. So let, and now we turn it on ab above that. Now we can just follow the poles. So there are these solutions. We'll talk about them a little bit more. And they move upwards continuously. And eventually, one of them reaches the real axis. So this is a pole on the real axis. Um, so it's a purely outgoing, so in this context, it's a purely outgoing solution um, of the wave equation um, at that frequency. And the fact that it moved in some particular trajectory depends on what I assume about the gain medium. It would move differently if I assume something different about what the resonances of the gain medium are. Okay. So, so we have an eigenvector of this linear non-hermission or non-unitary S matrix with eigenvalue tending to infinity for a real frequency. So at least for a nanosecond, we have a physically meaningful pole as opposed to being just a sort of a formal solution, which we normally have in scattering theory. Okay, I'll come back to that. And something called the threshold lasing mode with some frequency. But we'll immediately realize that, gee, if we have this pole on the real axis and we even put a little bit of real energy in, then it's infinitely amplified, which would you know, cause infinity. So you need that nonlinear saturation to prevent this unphysical catastrophe if you uh, do actually get a pole on the real axis. But for finding when lasing starts, this linear non-unitary analysis tells you how to do it for anything. Okay, and it turns out that this problem under certain many conditions will have more solutions that you can keep pumping harder and you'll get another frequency also turning on and so on. And that's called multimode lasing and that's what SALT was particularly good at studying and, and calculating. Okay, so let me make this point a little bit further about the difference between this object, which I call a threshold lasing mode, which is a pole on the real axis, and a resonance that we're all familiar with from scattering theory. Okay, so let's take the same simple model uh, in one dimension, okay, and then we're saying, okay, I have a real K here, but a complex N due to the fact that it's being pumped, etc., and I'm trying to solve the boundary condition of purely outgoing at some K, which is the Sommerfeld boundary condition. And this is clearly non-hermission. Um, K is the lasing frequency, which we'll see is not really known. We have to search for it self-consistently. And what you need to do is you need to tune both the frequency and the amount of gain to get a solution, to get this discrete, purely outgoing solution pole on the real axis. OK. The thing that we're, uh, and this we call a constant flux state, because outside it's really just an outgoing plane wave. OK. So somehow the gain medium is implicit here because I've got this complex N, okay? And as I said, so that means once I solve it, inside the cavity it's a sign, but it's a sign of a complex argument. So it grows. It's not just an oscillatory function. It's not our emission function. And flux is not conserved. The flux that I like is not conserved. 
there are more photons here than there are here. You know, they're, they're growing as it goes out. So that's, you know, that's what this function does. Um, okay, so that's really the lasing mode at threshold. Now, the thing we know from scattering theory is we say, okay, we have some cavity or some potential, and now we're looking for a complex frequency that gives us a purely outgoing solution at a complex K. This is also a non-remission boundary condition, and if we tune the real and imaginary part of K, we'll, we'll find these solutions. These are the resonances or quasi-modes or quasi-bound states, okay? Uh, but this is not the same problem. That's the, the point that I, and not necessarily to you guys, but to the community I try to emphasize. Okay, so here we look at the solution. It's now also sign of a complex argument inside, but then outside it's an out, outgoing complex plane wave. So it's growing. If you look at the sign of K, which must always be negative, I didn't emphasize that, but the fact you all know that the poles have to be in the lower half plane and so on. So that means that this sign is going to, going to grow to infinity. Th this, uh, this outgoing function is going to grow at infinity. It's not actually a normalizable solution. So why that... Is it, why is it... It's growing with x. Yes. So, but outside, what's, what's making it grow? Right, so it's just a formal solution. That's, you, you've got it. That's the point. People tend not to take the imaginary part seriously outside, but if I just look at the definition of this problem, my solution is an unphysical growing thing outside. So... <laughs> Because this is something you can calculate from the passive cavity without putting the gain medium in, people sort of tended to, to focus on this. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to, of course, the quasi-bound state you know is the place where you get resonances and scattering, okay? But this, this growth is unphysical. So my point is that the resonances are not really physical solutions of Maxwell's equations. They're formal solutions in the complex plane that are not normalizable at infinity, okay? It does have some physical meaning because it's, problem of decay, like yes. some of right. So the further you look, the more particle you find. Right, so that's always the interpretation. If you want to interpret it as saying that, well, it's decaying and that all the particles are out of infinity, or you can do a, you can start with a non, not with the quasi-bound state, but with just a wave packet in there and see how it leaks out. So it, it has a lot of, it has that meaning, sure, and that's what people talk about. But in lasing physics, we have this steady state outgoing thing, not decay, and this is not the solution, although you would think it is from much of the literature. Okay, so. Right. Okay, so they're not physical solutions, but the threshold lasing modes are solutions of Maxwell's equations, and they're exact at threshold. Once you, you know, infinitesimally above, you have to stabilize them with the nonlinearity. And the one thing I like about this is a completely general description of lasing. So I just showed you the, the textbook laser with these uniformly sp spaced resonances that then become you know, poles on the real axis when you add gain. This is a chaotic D-shaped cavity, which I'm going to come back to at the end, um, with really complicated uh, poles, uh, pole structure, different kinds of resonances. Here's one that actually turns out to be the lasing mode. And I can still say that the lasing transition is I add a gain, this is the gain curve that we've assumed, and some pole in the middle here wins the race, and that's the lasing mode. Okay, so this allows us not to have a different theory for every type of cavity, which is sort of, if you look at the laser literature, they, they do the 1D cavity, and then they kind of, every time there's a new cavity, they kind of reinvent some kind of basis to do it in. This is the, the correct thing. Now, the infinite linear response is stabilized by this saturation denominator, which determines a unique amplitude. So right here, we have a non-trivial solution of the linear problem as opposed to the trivial solution where the solution psi is zero. It's coming online. It's like a bifurcation in the solution set. And, uh, and infinitesimally above, I have to add this, this um, non-linearity to give me a finite and unique answer. It's no longer a linear problem, so I don't have the freedom of changing the amplitude, and that amplitude is then predicted by solving the self-consistent nonlinear equations. And here's an example. Uh, in my earlier talks, I spent a long time bragging about how well this works. Here, I'm gonna assume some of you have heard that. So this is the simple cavity with three mode lasing. One, uh, one two, three, this is the total. The, the data points are by brute force integration of the Maxwell block equations in time, which 
Everybody agrees you can do if it's a simple problem. So this is the truth, the, da the data points. And then our approximate, but apparently very accurate theory is the, is the solid lines. Um, and this, you know, the, it's the nonlinearity that's determining these, the values here. Okay. Uh, so you have this nonlinear steady state, um, which uh, then, you know, is some number of poles on the real axis, some number of lasing modes, and then some others trying to turn on, which may or may not, due to the nonlinear interaction. Okay. So, and even though artistically we drew this with a little width, I think, just for artistic reasons, actually it's, there's no width at all. So the laser lines are infinitely sharp in the semi-classical theory. Okay. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I learned was that a pole on the real axis is a bound state, which is true. For a emission problem, I can have a bound state. Um, and I can even have a bound state in the continuum that won't couple to the continuum and it'll be a pole on the real axis. But it doesn't carry anything out to infinity because, you know, there's no net flux and it doesn't violate conservation of energy or anything like that. So this is a pole on the real axis has a totally different meaning. I think it's very interesting. Okay. And so how do we solve this, this kind of equation? Well, we, we use a non-hermission basis set and actually it's very similar to what... Uh, is it Dorje? I, I don't know exactly. Dorje was talking about yesterday. Uh, okay, I'll skip that. Okay, so we have a certain basis set that we choose. I'm going to tell you a little bit about. We expand the nonlinear solution in it. This has this nonlinearity H of R here. And, um, um, uh, and uh, right at threshold, you can show that this expansion only has one term. So one of our basis set is going to be the solution at threshold and above threshold we have to add in uh, others. Okay. So, and here's our linear problem, non-remission problem, defining the basis set UN. So we have the usual wave equation with the cavity. We have the, the, the gain profile, wherever we're pumping, we're calling F of R. That turns out to be technically important. I won't go into it. Um, and then we have this non-linear, this non-hermission eigenvalue e to n of k, which depends on exactly what frequency we're going out at. We have outgoing boundary condition at k. So this is a, 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 a you know, now defines at each k, it turns out a full basis set of solutions, which can expand any outgoing solution. So it can expand the non-linear one here, which we then iterate to, to consistency, self-consistency. Okay, and that's a biorthogonality relationship of the type that Dorje was talking about yesterday and many of you know all about. Um, so that's a good tool to use to, to solve this nonlinear problem. Project onto this outgoing constant flux basis. When you project onto this basis, it becomes a finite map, uh, San Picos. So there's your mat nonlinear map, if you prefer, where we're looking for fixed points of this nonlinear map. Um, okay. Um, okay, so now this e to n is, is kind of interesting, this eigenvalue that appears here. This is sitting where the actual susceptibility in the Maxwell equation was. So here we had a function which was determined by the gain medium before. We didn't get it to choose this. Okay, but for any particular k, there are only certain values of this complex number which allow an outgoing solution. So the eigenvalues we're going to find are all the possible values of the susceptibility that um, allows to have a perfectly outgoing solution, which is just some complex number with some, some real part and some imaginary part, okay? Um, so it's all the values that would lead to lasing at that frequency. So the sort of, the, the conceptual thing we do is we actually find for the real susceptibility what the lasing frequency is. Uh, okay, so we, you know, we, I don't know, you pick anyone, pick, uh, which one do I pick? I don't know, let's see what I got here. Okay, pick this one. So we actually say, oh, okay, this is the first lasing mode. Now let's find all the other values of the susceptibility that would laze at this frequency. And the way we do that is actually literally to take all the other poles. So with the real susceptibility, this pole goes here, this pole goes here, this pole goes here, et cetera. The real susceptibility of our Maxwell problem. But with this eigenvalue problem, it's sort of saying, well, suppose we had a different susceptibility so that's the real lasing mode with the Maxwell problem. But now as we have different susceptibility, oh, we could take this pole and put it there. 
Okay, so this basis set, so we drag all the poles, all the countably infinite number of poles to this 1K, which we do by putting a big real part, which ships the frequency. Okay, and that's, that's my basis set. If you want a, some sort of intuitive picture of the basis set, so I kind of like this picture. Okay. Um, okay, now let me talk about the amplifier problem. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, so the amplifier problem is in some sense simpler, okay? Um, what we're gonna say is, well, we might have some lasing modes. These are these guys, the ones, I'm sorry, this is a different slide, and emu is what I was calling psi-mu. Sorry about the change of notation. Um, and E alpha is the ones where we actually input. So we input and we scatter and it amplifies. Some number of lasing modes, some number of amplified modes. This is work that was done by Alex Surgeon. Um, and the, uh, the gain susceptibility just has a saturation term from the lasing modes and the saturation term from the amplified modes, if there are any lasing modes. If I'm only doing the amplifier, then this term isn't there, and I just have this, but I have a different boundary condition. Okay, so you need an incoming wave to define the input, this input, and this is actually, again, where Dorje set the, I don't know if he's here, but he's probably taking care of the daughter, but, uh, uh, he set the table for me because this is essentially those left eigenvectors or right eigenvectors, you know, the other eigenvector, whatever, the dual, whatever, we, I can't remember if it was left and right, but okay, it gets, yeah. The other one, V. So this is the one that's purely incoming, whereas the, the other base set is purely outgoing. It's essentially the complex conjugate in this case if we have just a real uh, cavity dielectric function. So we have this incoming basis set, so that can represent the input, and it has this nice property that, um, right, so this is, this is our outgoing thing that we had for the laser, and now we have an incoming input, which is what's put into the amplifier, okay? And by using the incoming state, we don't get any reflection. That's a state that's perfectly absorbed. It's the time reverse. So, um, so we, don't, we don't mix up the flux that's, flux that's coming out of the amplifier with the input, which is only going in. So it's a nice way to use these non-hermission functions to describe the amplifying as opposed to the lasing boundary condition. That was something Alex came up with. Here's a complicated plot showing how well this theory works. Uh, let me just, okay, I'll just say a, a word about it. So we wanted to do this thing called injection locking. So the blue is the lasing mode and we're inputting near the lasing mode. So we pumped it hard enough, it's actually lasing. And there's this well-known thing that if you inject a, a larger and larger amount of energy at a nearby frequency, you can lock this to that. That's called injection locking. So this, the way we look at it, this just goes away and it all goes into this. And, um, uh, and so here we don't put anything in, so there's no amplified line at all. So this is just the lasing intensity as a function of pump. Then we stop and we start to input energy, input energy, here, and the amplified output picks up, the lasing output gets suppressed to zero. Okay, and I, I don't wanna go, this isn't the point of the talk, just this amplifier theory works, and it's quantitative, because these, these are the data points from, from brute force integration. So we know that the theory which uh, is, 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 uh, is accurate. Okay, so we're gonna just talk about amplification. We're not gonna talk about this more complicated case where we have both lasing and amplification. Okay, well, or at least we're not talking about it. So part of the motivation for, for what, what I'm doing in this talk is this famous paper by famous laser physicists who I admire. I, I don't know Lang, but Marlon Scully, some of you probably know, and Willis Lamb is the famous Lamb. Okay, and they wrote this paper, why is the laser line so narrow? A theory of single quasi-mode laser operation. It's a pretty good example of people trying to do non-hermission physics without admitting it's non-hermission, okay? So, um, so remember, we've got these infinitely sharp lines within the semi-classical theory, okay? Um, and uh, they made a model where they say we have this small cavity region with gain, and then we have the universe, which is a big box with Dirichlet boundary condition way, way away at minus L, okay? Um, and uh, they solved the Maxwell block lasing equations in this box, which is Hermitian. Okay, they didn't, well, well, before they put in the gain, it's Hermitian. 
And at some point, they say, well, we really don't want these reflections from here because they're unphysical. So we're going to put some damping in the universe. Uh, we're going to make it non-hermitian at the end to avoid unphysical properties due to that. But they solve the, the hermitian problem and solve everything in that basis set. Okay. And what they find is that the lasing mode of the cavity is somehow a superposition of many, many modes of the big box. And I think that's, that's not quite correct. Okay, so here's the problem, or uh, you know, essentially this problem I analyzed, but for a two, not a one-sided. Th this thing you only emit out into the universe. You don't emit this way. Here you can emit in both ways because I like to look at transmission resonances. So here are my passive cavity transmission resonances with some lifetime gamma cavity over two width gamma cavity over two. Just the same kind of picture you saw earlier, but now we're going to uh, analyze it carefully with the amplifier. Okay, so let's see, what do I, any more I want to say about it? Okay, so this is no, no gain uh, resonances of the passive cavity on the real axis. Okay, um, now suppose I start to pump it, okay, and I put the same amount of flux in. So here's my transmission resonance here, the, the red, the outermost curve, is this same resonance just plotted on a different scale, okay? So we can see it better. And it, it's transmission one. Now I start to pump, I'm amplifying, and so I get more out. It, it goes above one, okay? And it narrows. And you can see that the pole under here moves up. But because I'm putting something in, the solution can never correspond to the pole being on the real axis. That, that is only an outgoing solution. So you can never quite reach at the lasing frequency, uh, the pole being on the real axis, if you insist on putting something in at that frequency. So the last curve here, the narrowest curve I'm showing you, um, is there's some small asymmetries. I forget about the asymmetries here. I can explain those. Um, but it doesn't reach the real axis because the input actually stops the lasing. And the last line here, the highest, narrowest uh, line shape here, you're above the lasing threshold. So if you didn't put anything in, you'd be lasing at that frequency. But you put something in and it's not quite lasing. Okay, so there the line is not infinitely sharp when we do it as an amplifier. It has some finite width, which depends on the degree of gain. Okay, it's finite but smaller. So this is called gain narrowing, but it doesn't give you zero width. And this is what Scully and Lamb were addressing. But now we say, okay, well, how do we actually see this, this transition to self-oscillation? Well, what we do then is we sit at exactly, oh, sorry, this is the picture you already saw. This is the new picture. So we start from the narrowest line. So this, this here is the narrowest line here. And now we turn down the input amplitude. And now you see it narrows even further. And the pole, eventually, when we turn it to zero, we have a pole on the real axis and an infinitely sharp line. So this is how to find, with the, with the nonlinearity treated correctly, the, the zero line width. Uh, that asymmetry is what we call line pulling. So we didn't put the atomic frequency at the cavity resonance. So it gets pulled a little bit. That's, and I actually, if I had to do all over, I would tell Alex not to do that, because everybody says it looks a little weird. But uh, that's what's going on. OK. All right, so this is really zero line with it, just a restatement of what I told you. But this is really the question that Scully and Lamb were talking about. You know, how do you get that? And they specifically say in their paper, well, the problem with this gain narrowing problem is it doesn't treat the nonlinearity. But this argument, everything treats the nonlinearity correctly. All right, all right. So it's it's really due to the discreteness of the poles, etc. Okay, now where are the modes of the universe? Okay, so this is what Scully and Lamb did. They put this, this gamma outside to avoid reflections. And then they said, oh, there's this very dense set of modes of the universe, which, and this very broad resonance in the cavity, and many of these modes uh, contribute uh, to, to the solution. This is the solution they write down. And you see the, they've got a sum over time dependence due to these many modes here. This is the frequency of the lasing. Okay, and then they have this Hermitian sign, which we know is wrong, right? So it's sign of a real argument cannot be the solution. Okay, they neglected what we call the limiting absorption principle. So what you need to do 
is if you want to correctly get the outgoing boundary condition, you need to take L to infinity and then gamma to zero. And then you'll get the correct outgoing condition. But they didn't do it that way, so they ended up with this different thing. So, all right. So, um, if you do that, you'll end up with a complex sign here, purely outgoing flux. And this is, this is now just actually demonstrating that. So here what we're doing is we're starting with finite gamma and we're making L longer and longer. And when, when L isn't too long, you see kind of a mixture of poles, you know, some that are lower, higher, et cetera. But when L gets longer and longer compared to the cavity, out emerge these one single pole which is the actual resonance of the cavity, okay? And the rest are these resonances of the universe that have no physical meaning because this damping outside is not physical. It's just something you put in for convenience. So, um, so there's no kind of merging of modes of the universe. There's just the resonance. And this is not actually a solution of the TLM, of the lasing problem. It's really just a solution of the resonance problem, okay? So you recover the passive cavity, and et cetera. And this is, this is the solution that we get corresponding to the poles that are physical here, these guys, um, you get purely outgoing like I showed you, okay? And then these unphysical modes of the universe are our standing waves that don't have any meaning, okay? So, okay, so there are two ways of doing it. The way we do it with purely outgoing boundary conditions or this fictitious absorption. That's okay if you do it right. And in the modern photonics world, there's this thing called a perfectly matched layer which lets you impose this outgoing uh, dissipation uh, at very sh small distances. So this is actually how they do it. Okay. All right. So I'm running out of time. So I'll just set the stage uh, very quickly for Adi, and then I'll show you the applications uh, at the end. So um, yeah, I think I'm, um, maybe I'll just say a few things. I won't go all through this. Okay, so let me just explain what's the interesting thing about where this theory fails. So this is actually a theory of the expectation value of E and P. The equa these are not the operator electric fields here. This is expectation value. That's what Maxwell's equations are. Okay, and so of course the averages we're calculating are all correct. So this, everything we've done is correct for the average electric field. But the operators have quantum fluctuations and there really is a drive here even when there is no, you know, no lasing. So there's a, a, a fluctuating quantum drive here of the operator, which when I do the, you know, average of higher moments, it'll give me Langevin driving random forces. So that's the, the thing that's left out of just treating Maxwell's equations plus quantum matter. Um, and the people know this for a long time, and they know it gives you a finite line width in the real laser, which this is the shallow towns formula with the cavity resonance here, et cetera. And there's a huge distinguished history of working on this. The way people think about it is if I think of the lasing solution, semi-classically is this perfectly rotating phaser, then what happens is occasionally I have spontaneous emission and I jump the phase and so the phase diffuses. And when it's diffused, you know, look at the time it takes to diffuse two pi or pi and you get the line width, okay? So, um, so you can, uh, there, now there's, so this gives you basically this with many, many approximations. And if you work harder, it gives you a lot of corrections to this. And um, I'm going to let Adi talk about this more. Um, one of them, perhaps the most important one is the, is the Peterman factor, which is excess noise due to the non-orthogonality of the modes. Um, I think I'm going to skip our derivation. So what we did was, we said, well, look, the S matrix is a um, right near the lasing point. It's dominated by this one diverging eigenvalue. This gamma P is going to zero because the pole is going to the real axis. So we can approximate the whole S matrix by this. This is, again, the kind of representation we saw yesterday with Dorje. And, um, and then we analyze that as the scattering matrix for the operators. And I'll skip that. You know, I'm just saying we have an input-output theory, et cetera, and I'm not going to go through what we did. But there's all, this is the Langevin force term for the operators, which this is you know, the input-output theory. is an output operator for an input operator plus some reservoir contribution. But I, I'll skip through the, what we did. We found a different version of the, um, 
I mean, a, a different representation of the shallow towns formula with all these corrections to it. And um, the only thing I want to say, uh, I think, it, it, that might be particularly interesting to you is that this kappa, this K here, which is called the, was known as the Peterman factor, we find in a different form. But, um, it, and I'll skip through these results uh, here, but I just want to say that it's been known at least for 20 something or 30 years, I don't know, Barry has known for a long time and talked about the fact that, uh, well, if I have this uh, orthogonality relation and I have an exceptional point, then this Peterman factor that goes like one over this integral will be zero because at an exceptional point you have this self-orthogonality effect. And it turns out even in our more modern uh, calculations of the line width, we, we also have this kind of effect um, that near an exceptional point, the line width gets really big. So and you're, saying, you're saying K is infinite. Right. K becomes infinite. So yeah. So that's not true, right? Nothing's ever infinite, except maybe in particle physics. So, um, so but it's interesting. You know, we're, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and this is some numerics that I got from Matthias Lurzer. I don't know if it's published now, just showing this divergence. What's happening is that our theory says the line width should depend on the residue of this pole. That's what gamma L is. But this is, turns out to be a double pole now. And so, you know, formally this, the, the resonance of the single pole is uh, diverging. And uh, I, we understand what's going on here. And I think Adi will talk about it. So. Okay, so we understand there's a double pole, and that means we have to do some different treatment at an exceptional point of the laser line width, and it's going to involve cutting off this unphysical divergence because it can't really happen that way. And I think Adi has some ideas, maybe not quite the full answer on how to do that. So this is a real interesting problem in non-emission physics. What happens to the line width at an exceptional point where we have to somehow uh, improve the, the approximation we made to the green function? Okay, and this is the, there's a new line width equation which we call n salt or noise plus salt and um, I won't go into this, the, I hopefully we'll hear about it from Adi. Um, but the, the only thing I want to say about it is the E here is the calculated average field from salt. So there's an analytic formula and everything here is known. So if you do the salt calculation, you know the, the electric field of the line then you just calculate a number, which is the line width. So it's an output of, of this here. Okay, let me see. What am I going to talk about? Um, uh, I was going to show talk about the applications. Maybe I'll just... Uh, uh, take, take a few more minutes because it started. All right, all right. So I'll... Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, these are all things I've talked about, but some people might not have heard about them. So there's this kind of duality in the lasing problem which is, uh, sorry, thanks, um, which is, you know, we look for these solutions where I have purely outgoing waves and I have gain, and if I just complex conjugate the threshold lasing equation, I find that if I put in the time reversal of the lasing mode and I replace gain by loss, then I also have a solution. It corresponds to the fact that in the complex plane, there are symmetric zeros when I have no gain or loss. And now when I add loss, instead of, what I do with the laser where I pull up, sorry, well, I don't have it here, but um, you know, with the laser, I add gain and I pull this up. Now if I add loss, I pull a zero down. And, that, and it turns out the solution is just the complex conjugate of the lasing mode, the incoming version. So this is uh, sort of the time reversal symmetry of the lasing equation at threshold. And uh, therefore, I can perfectly absorb this particular mode, but not any other input. Okay. And the, the amount of... Um, the amount of gain I, loss I need to put in is exactly the amount of gain I would need to put in to put the pole up here. So that, um, okay. And we did an experiment which confirmed this. Um, I'll skip that. It also tells you that you can actually impedance match to some tiny, tiny object. So this is just a, a gee whiz thing. We have a very small uh, uh, absorber, but strong absorber, shielded by all these scattering lossless disks, but if we think of this as the time reverse of a random laser, we can find an input wave that'll just be perfectly absorbed in that kind of uh, shielded region. So, okay, let me, now, 
The reason I want to mention is I do want to say a word about PT and lasers. If I have uh, you know, various kinds of PT setups for loss and gain, and I send in and I scatter out, uh, we were able to show, and other people showed, that there's a, an analog of the PT symmetry for the scattering matrix. And it implies that um, uh, the determinant of S is, is e to the i theta, but it's not unitary. And instead, you have this relation that if S is an eigenvector, little s is an eigenvector of the PT symmetric S matrix, then 1 over S star is also uh, an eigenvector, an eigenvalue, rather. And there are two cases. If, if S is unimodular, then 1 over S star is the same as S. So I haven't found a new solution. But if I, in the broken phase, they, they, they're not, if it's not unimodular, then one of these will be amplifying, the other will be attenuating, and, and the product will have modulus one, right? So you have the, the PT symmetry transition for scattering is this taking of an eigenvalue on the unit circle of the S matrix, and then having two of them meet and go off. One goes, in, oh, sorry, this is the unit circle. <laughs> now, imagine this is the unit circle, the PT transitions when two S matrix eigenvalues meet, one becomes attenuating, one becomes amplifying. So, um, and, uh, okay. And I just want to show you then this interesting thing that happens that you can actually get lasing. You can get uh, poles. The, so here are my poles that we're familiar with for this passive cavity. Um, and uh, you get this very interesting flow of the poles and the zeros. So eventually just when I have lasing, so I have a pole on the real axis, I also have the other eigenvector is perfectly attenuating, is coherently perfectly absorbed. And there's some experimental evidence for this, actually mounting experimental evidence that this can actually happen, um, which I won't be able to talk about. And I lose half of the resonances in the, in the, in the process, so I get this interesting doubling of the free spectral range and of course, very narrow resonances because it's lasing. Um, okay, so there's some signature of this this thing, and I'll skip this because it's interesting but complicated. So I won't go through that. And then at the end, I'll just talk about a couple of applications of salt. If you'll give me five minutes. Uh, so one application of non-emission physics that people have looked at is optical isolation. Okay, so. Um, in general, in linear optics, even with loss and gain, we have this reciprocity that, that scattering from I to J is the same as scattering from J to I. And people sort of ask, does PT symmetry allow a violation of this? And the answer is no, it does not. And you know, maybe misleading because they talk about unidirectional invisibility seems to be violating reciprocity. But if you look at that, actually what's happening is the transmission is the same from each side. It's just that on one side you have reflection. Okay. But none of the things people have done with linear PT violate reciprocity. And you can prove that. Okay. So the things they're doing to, to violate reciprocity, which the thing they're most interested in is isolation. I can go this way, but I can't go that way. And there's a huge interest in that pr for practical reasons. So here's a paper that I think uh, um, Carl mentioned that took uh, disks and put them next to each other and then found some isolation in the transmission through it uh, between the two fibers. Um, and they made it seem like PT was really essential, but it's a nonlinearity that's also essential. And this is some work I'm doing with Will Sweeney and a surgeon, uh, Alex Surgeon, um, that shows that actually you don't need the PT symmetry. The real thing you're using is the asymmetric coupling between the disks. So here I have a weakly coupled fiber to this, this resonator disk. I have a strongly coupled fiber. And what happens is that if you input on the strongly coupled fiber, it gets a big intensity in here. You saturate the gain, and you get less amplification out. Right? So you're going to come in here, and you're going to come around and go out there, or you're going to go this way. You get less amplification out on the strong coupling input than in the weak coupling input. And so that's just the nonlinearity that's doing this. I'll skip the pictures here and just show, yes, we indeed, this is the kind of non-reciprocity that we get uh, just do not to PT symmetry, but just having a saturable um, uh, transmission element there. Okay. Okay, I'll skip that. And then at the end, just say a, a, a word or two. I mean, I, I won't go into any more details there. Happy to talk about it if you have questions. Um, 
So the last thing I, I do think is really exciting, and it um, has to do with using salt and using complex lasers to do speckle-free imaging. So let me explain you, to you what the idea is. Um, so I'm really, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So the basic thing is if I have a spatially coherent light source, I'll see the double slit pattern. There's a definite interference pattern between the wave fronts. It, it, it can just be shifted. If I have a more complicated obstacle than a, a slit, then I get a speckle pattern, okay, which is sort of a complicated double slit pattern, if you like. And with single mode lasing, one mode, I'll always get this speckle pattern. It's a known problem. Okay, but it's not true if I have many, many modes in my laser. So, um, well, it turns out that if I have a complicated laser, like a random laser, uh, there's my colleague Wei Sao, who's a pioneer in this field, then I can actually control the coherence that I see. So this is the double slit pattern that I was talking about that's being measured in, in a random laser sent through a slit. And you see this nice interference pattern when I pump a small volume, okay, D2215. But when I pump a bigger volume, I have more modes this is the spectrum, and I see no double slit pattern. So if I can just laze in hundreds of modes, I actually will have a bright source, but I won't get this interference, okay? And this interference is a big problem for lots of imaging applications, and it's a problem because of the following thing, optical coherence. These are the collaborators on this uh, work. Um, the, the problem is very simple. If I'm imaging something here and I have some gunk, then some of the light gets scattered over to here where I should be imaging this point here, but I, instead I get a double image with that point because of, of having some imperfections in my optics. And so that's what I'm showing here, okay? And if I add up the intensity that's being measured by the camera, I see there's this cross term, which is order E1, which is the big field is going to be the direct field and there's gonna be a small amount of scattered field. So E2 squared is pretty small, but this cross term is not so small. And this gives you what are called coherent artifacts, and it messes up in lots of imaging applications. And uh, for example, if you want to do uh, this optical coherence tomography, I'll skip through this, okay. So, um, so here's a demonstration of the basic principle. Uh, what they did was they took this Air Force chart, which is just these bars here, and they put some gunk here intentionally, and they imaged through to, to a camera. Um, they did it with a helium neon laser, and they couldn't see the chart at all. But then they did it with a um, random laser, which has lots and lots of modes, and they see the chart. Okay. And since then, and I'll just skip to the, the basic point, we told them, you know, don't use a random laser, let's use a chaotic cavity instead. There are lots of advantages, I'll skip the details. And then we analyzed it with salt to find the optimal shape. And I'll skip through that, and I'll just show you the results. So um, what they're doing here is they're imaging the output of a laser, that just a semiconductor laser on a chip. They make three different cavity designs. They're imaging what comes out of the end of an optical fiber. And here's speckle for a Fabry-Perot cavity with only about three modes. That's what this M equals three is. If they put a disc-shaped cavity, they have 15 modes. They still see a lot of speckle. But if they have, um, this is really the end, okay? If they have, um, uh, they have this D-shaped cavity with 500 modes, then they see no speckle. And when they image the Air Force chart, they get this beautiful view. Okay, so this is a couple of applications of this non-hermitian laser theory. Thank you for giving me a little extra time. Thank, thank okay. you for your So I think you can take only one question. Yes. Well, as I said, um, a laser is solving a wave equation where the actual potential or index of refraction is complex. So you literally put the complex number into the wave equation. I think what, what I didn't understand was yeah. the, the pole still had the imaginary part, right? No. No. The, this, well, is, this is the... I'm not sure which picture you're thinking of, but the pole has no imaginary part. Its imaginary part goes to zero. No, no, no. I think you, uh, somewhere later, 
you showed that, that the, some some like this picture, and you showed that uh, you have the pole and yeah. the background. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So that picture was doing something else. That's instead of solving the outgoing boundary condition, you put fictitious absorption outside and you look for the the, you know, the quantized solutions with fictitious absorption. And when the, and that's a way of finding the resonances. That's not a way of finding the physical solutions. But that's what, you know, you can you can do more to find the physical solutions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that well, okay. It's a little. Tr I'll I'll explain the details. But you're right. That resonance wave function feels the 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 loss out there and does something. In fact, in fact, it decays instead of grows because it's not the same problem. Okay, few details. But so that but that was just a contrast to what people did for ages, which is they put this fictitious absorption and they solved in a box, thinking that they're going to turn a Hermitian problem into a non-Hermitian problem. And, you got to do it very carefully. Okay, I think we have to stop here and uh, thank the speaker.